feeling today? I feel okay. That's good. You look great. Well, thank you. I understand you have a little trouble remembering things. Yes, I, I do. I do have, well, a lot of trouble remembering things. You know, sometimes crossword puzzles. They help me sometimes. How long have you had trouble remembering things? That, I don't know myself. I can't tell you because I don't remember. Well, do you think it's days or weeks? Months? Years? Well, see, I can't put it in exactly on a day, week, or month, or year basis. But do you think it's been more than a year that you've had this problem? I think it's about that. One year or more. It had been 40 years since Henry had lost his memory. Time. Memory is affected by time. Like, right now, when you're watching this YouTube video, the memory is fresh in your cerebral cortex. Neurons are buzzing to hold on to the sounds, images, and scents. But as soon as this video finishes, that memory will start to dissipate. And eventually, you'll just forget. Unless you activate elements of your medial temporal lobe, you can process that memory and store it, creating a long-term memory. Well, that's where my story comes in. In 1953, patient HM's medial temporal lobe had been drilled... had been drilled... out of his skull... by... A surgeon. The morals of this action are actually still highly debated to this day, and that's something we'll get to soon. After this surgery, every memory made by patient HM would dissipate. He could no longer remember anything that happened more than a few minutes ago. He didn't know what age he was, what he just said, or what time it is. What time it is. What time is it? Learning about this story, I've come to understand that memory is not as simple as I initially thought. Like, it's easy not to appreciate your ability to remember, but memory is not just about remembering your friend's phone number or the digits of your pin. Memory is, in fact, our only tool to understand time, our sole ability to perceive time. We use memory to make sense of a timeline, to place ourselves in a specific spot. This happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, so now I'm here. I'm after this. Memory allows us to grasp onto the past and use it to understand where we are in time. We say the month starts here, then begin counting. So it's now the first day plus five days. It's the fifth. So that means in five more days, it'll be the tenth. Now it makes sense. I am here. But without memory, without knowing when that first day was, how can you tell where you are when the future is? Henry lived in this reality, in this reality outside of time. I think most people think about it as Henry was broken. But the more details you hear about this story, the more you'll start to realize that Maybe Henry had it better than us. Henry lived in a reality we can never know. A reality where your past can never haunt you. Where fears of the future are impossible. In many ways, Henry is the only man to ever live in permanent present tense. Oh. Oh. Hi. Um, now, I've got even more to tell you about memory and time. And I've even got a little mystery in here that we're going to try and solve. But first, 
I want to tell you a little bit more of this story. And to do that, we're going to have to go back. Back somewhere cold. Somewhere dark. Somewhere scary. Yippee! There'll be no wedding bells for today. William Beecher Scoville, a man who always wanted to work on cars. Love the damn things. But dad said become a doctor, it's a good profession, so you do as your dad says. Go to Yale, go to Pennsylvania, get board certified. Holy shit, you're a neurosurgeon. Open a training program, take more patients, take more risks. You're at the height of neurosurgery. You and your fellow surgeons lead the frontier. Technology now allows you to dive into people's brains and rewire things, remove what is wrong, add what is right. The perfect solution to so many problems, you just have to be daring enough to try, to experiment. What could possibly go wrong? Sit. Sit. Wagtail. What are you doing? Trying to teach my old dog a new trick. Sit. And how is that working out for you? Not well so far. I've seen people tell their dog to sit, and the dog sits. So I figure if I tell it to sit, it will eventually sit. Sit. That has to be the dumbest thing I've ever heard. We'll see who's laughing when the thing sits. Sit. Sit. Why don't you just try Skillshare? What is a Skillshare? The online learning platform. Just type what you want to learn. Chances are, there's a course for it. See, right here canine master clash semicolon bonding with your dog through dog training tricks and games. Okay. But what if I want to understand my cat on a deeper, psychological level? Right here mate, animal psychology, learn to understand your yeah, pet. Yeah, 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 but what if I want to write a sonnet in seven lessons? Write a sonnet in seven lessons. How much is this so-called quote-unquote Skillshare? Ten bucks a month, plus the first 1,000 Disrupt members get- Finally, my dog has sat. Calvin? Calvin, what? your dog was always sitting. Stand. <laughs> when Henry Melison was seven, he had a bike accident. The accident left him with intractable epilepsy, giving him almost daily seizures. And then I will say... <sighs> this likely isn't what you expected when I said seizure, but this is a petty mal seizure. <laughs> and that, oh. It's kind of just like when someone dozes off mid-conversation. This was manageable for Henry, but at 15, things changed. He had his first grand mal seizure. The kind most people think of when you say seizure. Um, the seizures increased in frequency and severity uh, over the years until by the time he was uh, about 15 or 16, he began having major seizures often daily, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, it was a sort of devastating illness to every part of his life, from his social life to his academic life. Uh, he was unable to really engage with the world in, 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 in the way you might like, uh, in the way he, he, in ways he would have liked to. Um, I mean, one of the more poignant examples of how it affected him always to me was, you know, he, he struggled for years to make it through high school, which was very difficult for him because of the, the, these seizures. Uh, and when he finally did get his high school diploma at the age of 22, um, the principal of his high school wouldn't allow him to go across the stage to collect the diploma because he was afraid that Henry might have a seizure while he was on the stage, which would have embarrassed the whole, um, the whole assembly. Um, by 27, Henry was on three different drugs taken multiple times a day. The drugs were deteriorating his brain. Henry and his family had become desperate to see their lives normalized again. But what kind of miracle treatment could ever save him? Would it ever even exist? 
Well, in 1953, Dr. William B. Scoville offered a solution. The brain itself has no pain receptors. Because of this, Henry did not undergo anesthesia. They numbed his scalp, but he lay awake during the surgery. Scoville had no way to see inside Henry's brain. He could peek through a little hole he made, but for the most part, he was guessing. Scoville's goal was to remove the majority of Henry's medial temporal lobe. In his heyday, Scoville was famed for his work on the now infamous lobotomy surgery in which someone's frontal lobe is almost entirely detached, leaving them, for a lack of a better term, disabled. Once heralded as the miracle cure to psychosis, the practice is now related with the worst of 20th century surgery. William Scoville had performed 43 lobotomies in the past. Now, in the modern day, with the lobotomy coming under scrutiny and new laws coming into place banning the practice, Scoville had to find a new miracle surgery. So, in what he described as a project of direct surgical attack, Scoville experimented on two women with psychosis and epilepsy. His goal was to see results on reduced psychosis, but it was by chance that removing these areas actually lessened much of the women's epilepsy. Taking from this finding, and findings of others in his field, Scoville decided removing these areas of Henry's brain should lessen his seizures. Why acts like this went unchecked for so long is still somewhat of a mystery, though the common conclusion is that self-reporting from surgeons allowed them to embellish the quality of their results. Following the procedure, Henry's seizures had actually subsided. His epilepsy was seemingly cured, but there was a new problem, his memory. Okay, now this is getting all a little bit confusing, so I'm gonna have to ask something of you. I need you to go inside my mouth. <laughs> now, you have memories, both long-term and short-term. Short-term memories are generally clustered around the area used to perceive the memory. So, a short-term verbal memory would be maintained in the left side of the cortex, where language and speech are processed. A short-term spatial memory would be maintained in the right parietal lobe, where spatial knowledge is processed. Basically, where the activity happens, the short-term memory will float around. If you were to remember a number for filing something out, you might repeat it in your head over and over. 8214. 8214 keeping that short-term memory alive for as long as you can. But if you want to remember that number far off into the future, you need to process that memory through your hippocampus to create a long-term memory. The hippocampus, the very brain region scraped out of Henry. Researchers ran test after test on Henry to try and prove this distinction between long-term and short-term memory, and in doing so, had rewritten our understanding of memory. The study became famous worldwide, and this is where Henry got his cool nickname, Patient HM, to keep his identity a secret. Henry had no idea. You could tell him, but he'd just forget a few seconds later. For a moment there, Henry was one of the most famous people alive and he had no idea. By this point, everything was going perfectly. A horrible accident had turned around to fund a wealth of knowledge. Except, there was just one thing out of place. Every once in a while, Henry, the man with no memory, would remember. Henry, how 
how did you remember that? With your memory problem, how did you remember the layout of your house? Henry, the man with no memory, could remember. Subtle things, but slowly it became more and more clear. Henry could remember the layouts of his new residences, the layouts of his hospitals. He'd somewhat recognise people, and he'd even become accustomed to the upgrades in technology over time. See, what researchers came to learn is that memory isn't quite as organised as it first seemed. In part, the blame is on language. The words we use to describe memory are far too loose to properly categorise what memory really is. Like your hand knowing which fingers to place where properly to hold a pen. Is that memory? What about breathing? Do you have a memory you're pulling from to remind yourself to breathe? Can you forget how to breathe? Is breathing a memory or a skill? A skill is just collections of memories? Isn't this all quite semantic? Well, that's the trap researchers were stuck in. They found major differences between consciously remembering with and without effort. So the terms implicit and explicit memory were created. Okay, when you learn to ride a bike, there's only so much someone can tell you. They can't stand by and okay, go- Okay, stop moving, okay. No, you put your, put your leg in there, no. Some things you just have to learn by doing. And that's exactly what an implicit memory is. These things Henry could pick up gradually over time. He could get used to things. Naturally learn the layout of his house, feel some sort of comfort around people he'd met before. What Henry's case showed us is that these two classifications of memory are also present physically in the brain. Henry couldn't use his hippocampus to consciously remember things. He couldn't create an explicit memory, but he could use his parahipparhinal cortex to learn by doing, be conditioned, create an implicit memory. So the mystery of the man with half a brain is solved. Henry, the man with no memory, could remember. Now, so far, I've told you a pretty straightforward story. A big bad meanie surgeon came along and broke a guy's brain, and then a merry band of neuroscientists came along and figured the whole thing out. And to be honest, that's how the story was told up until very recently. See, this story isn't finished. It's still going today. It's a very personal story for you because the doctor who performed the surgery on patient HM was your grandfather. In 2016, Luke Dietrich, the grandson of William Scoville, published a book that disputed a lot of the claims that Henry was as much of a willing and happy participant as is made out, as well as disputing the general narrative that his grandfather was some sort of evil villain. Grandfather was a neurosurgeon. Uh, he was, by all accounts, a brilliant neurosurgeon and a renowned one. He was the, you know, he, he founded and, and was the director for many years of the Department of Neurosurgery at Hartford Hospital. Um, he was a Yale professor. He, he, um, uh, he did a lot of good. I mean, he saved a lot of lives. But one of the things I, I discovered was that for a period of a dozen years at least, uh, Henry was the only person signing his informed consent forms um, when he was, uh, you know, being experimented on. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to make the argument on a number of levels that Henry could, was actually in a position to consent on his own behalf. Now, you see, there's a whole secondary moral argument to this. See, the first was like, you know, is it okay what Scoville did? And generally, it's a pretty easy question. Most people answer no. Human experimentation is bad. We shouldn't test things on living people. There's definitely an argument to be made that what happened to Henry and other people like him might have had some kind of positive effect on the world overall. How much longer would it have taken us to understand these complex systems of memory without a sort of case study to go off? It might have taken all the way until now, the 2020s, when we can really get detailed brain scans before we could properly start making sense of a lot of this. The more complex one, and one that has come up more recently, is the question of following the surgery was keeping Henry, a man with no memory, a man with an awful disability, keeping him being tested continually for years and years. It's a hard subject to talk about, and I'm 
barely scratching the surface. So, uh, is it okay to drill into someone's head uh, for the benefits of larger humanity and science in general? Once that action is done, is it okay to then have that person tested on for the rest of their life? I mean, for the same reasons, for the, the greatness of humanity, for the progress of science, is it worth it? Is it moral? What about this? What happened to Henry? Losing your memory. Is there a benefit to that? Is there something we can learn that maybe we overvalue memory in some way? Was Henry free from things that we're attached to, stuck to, can't escape from? Is there something beautiful about the fact that Henry lived in the present? Or is it just depressing and the dude had a horrible disability? That's very possible. As I'm saying, these are all questions. Questions I don't have answers to, but hopefully something fun for you to think about. Um, that's my video. I hope I got you thinking. I hope I told you some interesting things. Thank you for letting me come in and tell you all this sh for about 20 minutes. Um, that's it. I hope to see you all again. Goodbye. Such a night. You're such a night.